Shalom everyone, and we're learning today Parashat Bo, the Exodus. The real story of the Exodus is uh, unfolded in front of us in Parashat Bo. Uh, Parashat Bo starts in the book of Exodus. Uh, just a second. Chapter 10, verse 1. And let us go a little bit before that, just give us to give us uh, the background. The story of the Exodus is not just, as we know, as we learned here today, is not just a description of a, an amazing, very important event in the history of humanity. The moment which Moses comes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go, which becomes the uh, flag of slaves trying to liberate themselves since then and on. But what if I'm not a slave? What if I live in a country that is not a slavery officially? What can we say? We all slaves, but, but the point is that slavery today is within. And the message of the Torah is not just about the a political slavery, economical slavery, we are talking first of all about the spiritual aspect, which is the internal slavery, the slavery to our body, the slavery to our addictions, the slavery to our narrow-minded thinking, the slavery to all that limits our abilities uh, to grow and to become real, true, free people. And I explained it before that many, many times that if we understand that concept, we realize that you cannot hand over freedom to somebody because people, freedom must be uh, accomplished, must, must be attained, cannot be given, cannot be gifted. So the story of the Exodus is also the individual story of each one of us in liberating ourselves from our own bondage. And we all have this kind of bondage. So here we are having the story of the Moses and the Israelites trying to get out of Egypt and Pharaoh says no. And the result is that Pharaoh is being plagued by 10 plagues. And here in the previous parasha, parashat Vayera, we had seven plagues. But what happened in, this, in the plagues? Pharaoh, why do we need 10 plagues? And the answer, we can look at one of the, uh, one of the uh, last plagues, the plague of hail. If we go back a little bit back to chapter nine, verse 27, and there was hail everywhere in Egypt. The hail was terrible together with fire, smashed all the crops, destroyed the trees and broke them down. Just, I'm reading verse 26, but in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites live, there was no hail. Verse 27, so Pharaoh is calling Moses and Aaron, and he says, remember, this is the seventh plague. And he says to them, Khatati apam. I sinned. Pharaoh admits, I sinned. Ah, it's my sin. Adonai HaTzadik Vani Vami Arshayim. God, and he is using the tet tetragrammaton, that the whole story was to deliver the consciousness, the acknowledgement, the awareness to freedom that we, which is a very important statement, we human beings, we are born to this world in order to deliver and fulfill the message of the creation, which is that the creator with all his loving and caring unconditionally created this world so we can receive his light, his joy, his fulfillment, and his happiness. However, 
This world has many, many obstacles for freedom and for happiness because as we said, you want to be happy, you have to attain the happiness yourself. No one can give you, can award you with happiness only yourself. So understanding that there is a God, there is the God, the God of love that he sent us to this world so we can receive. And all what we go through, even the hardest, most ugliest events in our lives, it's all for one purpose, to make us a greater vessel for the joy and pleasure that God wants to give us. And that's one of the major uh, perceptions and feelings of what is the name of God that in he, you can't translate it, but that's what is called the Tetragrammaton. And Pharaoh says, he is the righteous, and myself and my people, we are the wicked ones. So we can say, oh, Pharaoh repented. He finally got it. Or, or if we're talking about Pharaoh and Egypt as the side, the dark side of each human being, when we are in so much pain, we could come to an awareness that we have to change our ways, that we made huge, terrible mistakes and we really commit for the change. But then what happens? He's asking, verse 28, Please pray to God and stop the voices, stop the hail, and I let you go. And he won't, I won't uh, stop you anymore. Verse 29, and Moses says, you know, I'll leave the city, I'll pray to God and the hail will stop. Okay. Verse 33, and Moses got out from in front of Pharaoh, and he raised his hands to God, and the voices and the hail and the, and the rain did not come down anymore. Okay, verse 34. And Pharaoh saw that the hail and the, and the rain and the voices stopped, but Yosef Lachato and he continued to sin. And his heart was heavy, his and his servants. Okay, what do we get? Something that is so, so simple. Many, many years ago, I had a student and he, uh, he told the story that he was, uh, he was running a big uh, PR company, huge company, hundreds of people worked for him. He was doing great job, making huge amount of money. And then one day he has a heart attack, he's hospitalized, he has a near-death experience, he leaves his body, he goes to the light, he sees the light and he says, I just made such a big mistake. My life is such a big mistake. What was the whole thing about being busy and work and career and honor and power and money. I missed, the, I missed the story. It's a true story. And in front of the light, he commits to have a nice, decent spiritual life. Okay. And he's, they bring him back and he's resuscitated. He gets his life back. And you know what? He sells the company and he just get a little, company for him and his wife so they won't be bored and do nothing okay sooner or later they grow the company and he becomes again the same owner of the same company with hundreds of workers like he had before okay do we know the story somebody has a heart attack he wakes up 
He says, what kind of a life? It's terrible. I don't want the pressure. I don't want the negativity anymore. I'm changing from now on. I'm changing my life. I'm changing my diet. And you know what? That's going to hold on for a few weeks, a few months, uh, not longer than that. And sooner or later, we go back to where we have been. It doesn't happen to everybody, but most of the cases, when we are under the shock of our and the consequences of our wrong lifestyle, that of total addiction to food, alcohol, drugs, whatever kinds of terrible habits. And then the moment we don't feel the pain anymore, we don't realize, but we go back to where we've been to as the pain is not there anymore. Same is the story that we get over here. We get the same story of Pharaoh and Egypt is not just a historical uh, people that lived some 33 centuries ago. We are talking about today, our body, our body consciousness, our habits, all the slaveries we have, the slavery to our habits, to all those ideas and belief systems that enslave us, that we are so addicted to them. So we go there in a no time, even though the, uh, the sword is hanging above our head. Okay, so how do we deal with something like this? Because living in Egypt with Pharaoh, this is a daily experience. How many times we're trying to get rid of all kinds of addictions like this? And sooner or later, we find ourselves that we didn't go away. We're still in the same slavery, a slavery to a body consciousness, to the limitations, to the fears, to the, all of those habits and states of mind that basically put us in a jail that does not allow the spirit, the soul to reveal itself. So what's the answer that's in Parashat Bo? The answer is eternal. It's not just a description of historical event. No matter, it was a huge historical event. The question is, what's in it for me right now, today? I'm not going to leave any country. I'm not going to deliver myself from any slavery. Let's say I'm still staying in the same working place. I'm still staying in the same society. How, but what's in it for me? And the answer is like this. Chapter 10, verse 1, Parashat Bo. Adonai el Moshe, and God speaks to Moses again, the tetragrammaton. Bo el Paro, come to Pharaoh. Okay, I made his heart and the heart of his servants heavy. And that's also many times when we see the truth and we are terribly, deeply enslaved. It upsets us to see the truth. It even creates a reaction. It's like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to have any connection to it. And he continues, Leman shiti ototai ele bekibo. In order to put my signs in within him. What's that about? There are many, many levels to explain that. But the most important is, as the Zohar is teaching us, and in the Zohar of Perusha Sulam, verse 36, Amar Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon said, Hashta it legalarazin, this is the time to reveal secrets. They know me the kin leilavetata, these are secrets that connect to the above and below, which means reality is divided into what we can feel with our senses, that's called the below, and the above, the spiritual universe, what we cannot uh, perceive with our five senses and the brain of the senses, that's called the above. The universe is one. The universe is divided 
according in our imagination, according to our perception. Remember that. It's not that the universe is divided. Our perception is dividing it. So we are slaves to our poor perception. Why? You want to reach enlightenment? You need to do the job. And the job is overcoming all of those bad belief systems that enslave us, that are called Egypt and Pharaoh. In Hebrew, the word Egypt, Mitzrayim, means the narrow place. The body, when it's not spiritual, is a dungeon for the soul. Pharaoh is the same letters in Hebrew as hafra'a, disturbance. What disturbs us the most? Thoughts of anger, lust, negativity, narrow-mindedness, all of that belief system that we have, as we said. So, what is Zohar saying? It's a time to reveal the secrets of above and below, which means the secrets of how the universe behaves really, truly, not the way we think it does. Makato, what does it say? Bo el paro, come to Pharaoh. Halo lech el paro, should be said, go to Pharaoh. Come to Pharaoh in a biblical sense means, uh, and it happened, it appears a few times even, that come to Boel, come to somebody else. Usually the man comes to his wife, which means that's an act of uh, consummating the, 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 uh, the wedding, okay? Like what does God say to Moses? Go within him, penetrate inside, and he says, the Zohar says, yes. Ela oto et Moshe chadarim chadarim. He took Moses and brought him deep inside. El tanin chazak echad elion, to the big, great crocodile. Which is the great crocodile? We're talking about one of the aspects of the snake. Who's the snake? The, the, that figure that represents the dark side, negativity. You know, snake, the snake gave the tree of knowledge, gave the fruit to Eve and he made her eat it. Who is the snake? How many snakes do you know that can speak? We are talking about another aspect of our personality that is called the snake, that is called the great crocodile, Tanina Gadol, that is called Pharaoh or Egypt, all of that is about one thing. Moses, Yarami Panav, Moses was afraid of him. He could get close only to the uh, delta of the Nile. What does it mean? To the offshoots of the real problem. But what's the real problem of the whole humanity? Negativity, slavery to selfishness. If we look about Pollution. Pollution is usually out of greed, out of uh, not willing, especially today that everybody knows, not willing to take the responsibility for the damage that we bring to the whole world and to ourselves. Uh, all the wars around, it's all one little problem, which is the great snake or the great reptile. This is the desire to receive for the self alone, selfishness, egotism, the great power of darkness. Because, why? Because there's a rule of affinity. And according to the rule of affinity, we know that similarities can attract and communicate, which means all what we want as humans, we were programmed for that, is to connect to pleasure, happiness, love, excitement, fulfillment. All of that is basically uh, offshoots of one thing, enlightenment. Enlightenment is 
coming from God. And God said, let there be light. We're talking about spiritual energy, spiritual light. How can you connect to the spiritual light? How can we tap into it and be able to connect to it and receive from it legally? There's the law of, of uh, attraction, the law of affinity, which means you have to become as the light. He is giving, you should be giving. He is merciful, you should be merciful. He is compassionate, you should be compassionate, which means selfish people, the Mishnah says, are dead while they're still alive. Why? Because selfishness, selfishness is the opposite to the light. The light is all about caring, giving, compassion, all of these that's a light. It's expanding and giving unconditionally. You want to connect to the source of real, true power. Selfishness won't do that for you. We'll disconnect it for you. And therefore, our biggest enemy is selfishness. Our biggest enemy is Pharaoh and Egypt. Where? Deep inside. Our own slavery. When we can overcome that slavery, then we are redeemed. Then we can connect to endless light. We connect to the grid, the system of holiness, which means ongoing flow of ideas. That's called being in the zone, but really being there for the long term. That's the only way we can do it. But we can't just... Everybody wants to be empowered and fulfilled and connected to super forces, to the endless light of the creation. Everybody wants to. But the question is like this, are we willing to pay the price? What's the price? To give up selfishness, to give up egotism, to give up uh, being addicted to all kinds of offshoots of egotism and selfishness. That's a simple story. How do we do that? Most of us are so afraid of it that we are in a big, long journey of denial that we have the problem. Selfishness? Me? Of course not. It's look at those people. They're so selfish. They're so negative. They destroy the world and I'm going to fight them. If somebody says he has no selfishness left with him, and he's totally altruistic, he will be lying about other things too. If you're here in this world, you have that aspect, otherwise you have nothing to look for in this world. So every person has that problem to look deep inside and to find that point that disconnects ourselves from the endless light of the Creator, from the purpose of our reality of our life from our destination which means that the, the goal and the vision of every human being so how do you do that we learn it from pharaoh moses and pharaoh so what does the zohar say when the torah says come to pharaoh it means one thing if you want to destroy the source, the core of your problems, you have to come, you have to co somehow join together with your dark side. But, you know, when we say come to, means you have to bring in the light. Why? Because the only way to remove darkness is by bringing in the light. This is a very subtle but very important pillar of any journey of any human being. Yes, let's say I, we already understand that we have a problem. We understand that our limitations, our hurts, our negativity, Whatever limitations we have as human beings, it all comes to one thing. The snake, the dark side, selfishness, and whatever. No excuses. 
Oh, we all have excuses, okay? But as long as you still um, allow those excuses to control you, Pharaoh is still your ruler and Egypt is still your home. In order to be able to achieve what you really want to achieve, real free life full of happiness and joy and growth and creativity, you need to get rid of at least level by level of the darkness within. How do you get rid of it? You wait for a plague, you wait for hail, you wait for any kind of other plagues, and then under the pain and the pressure, maybe in the hospital, maybe another way, you start to promise God what they say, there are no atheists in the uh, foxholes, when the most atheist soldier digging in, you know, from the bombing, and you see the shells coming close and you start, yes, you, you don't believe in God, but you start to pray. Oh God, please save me. Okay. If just I'll be saved, I'll do this and this and this. I'll repent. I'll become a better person. I'll believe in God. And then he's saved and he forgets. I know stories like this. We all know stories like this. We all know very, uh, very intimately, intimately about ourselves. How can we really promise when things are really dire and painful and the moment the pain is over, we go back to our old customs. So how do we fight that? And the answer is you have to inject light because with rationality, you cannot fight and win that power. The only way is to come to the dark force within and inject God's light into it. There's no other way. And that is the secret of this parasha because this parasha is the story of the Exodus. We have here the last three plagues of the ten, okay? And the last three plagues of the ten end with the plague of the firstborn. That's the story. And the white ten plagues, we explain, ten sefirot, the first one was destroying the sefirat malchut, the lower sefirah of the darkness, and then sefirat yesod, and then sefirat hod, and then sefirat netzach, then sefirat tiferet. When we come to the hail, seven sefirat, the sefirat chesed, and now in our parasha, we have the last three plagues, the last three sefirot, which are uh, Bina, Chochma, Keter. Bina is the lowest, Chochma is higher, Keter is the highest. Those three plagues were there to destroy those three klipot, dark forces that basically control every human's life. How do we remove those klipot, those shells, those covers, those... Uh, uh, slaveries that we have, you bring in the light, especially when we come to the story of the plague of the firstborn. That starts on uh, before that, after the plague of the, uh, just to continue our line, uh, just the story of the um, locust. That's a uh, chapter ten, verse seven. Okay. It's like they are being plagued. The Egyptians are being plagued so much that the Egyptian empire is starting to crumble. Verse seven in chapter ten. Vaimu avdei faro elav. And the servants of Pharaoh tell him, Ad matai yezelanu lemokesh, shalach et anashim v'yavdu et Hashem Elohim. How long with that man will be our, uh, it's like mokesh means like, uh, like in modern Hebrew, mokesh is a mine. It can explode any moment and will destroy us. Shalach et anashim v'yavdu et Hashem Elohim matarem tidak yavda mitzrayim. 
send those people away. Let them worship their God. Don't you know that Egypt is finished? All the advisors of Pharaoh tell him, let them go. As long as they stay here, we get a plague after a plague. Egypt is finished already. The Egyptian economy is finished. The, the trust of the people in the government is finished. We don't have a country anymore. So, Pharaoh is sending to Moses and Aaron. And he says, go and worship God. Who is going? You lost. Why are you asking who is going? No, you still want to be in control. You didn't get it. You, you, it, you, don't, you can't give your terms. You lost. Just let them go and finish with it. That's when we are stuck to this egotistic thing or honor thing. Yeah, but I still want to be a little bit in control. That will be your complete demise. If you didn't understand it, if you finished, that's going to be if you continue to do it. And that's exactly what Pharaoh is doing. So Moses is saying, we'll go with our kids, with our elders, we'll go with our sons and daughters and our sheep, cattle. We go, it's the holiday of God for us. And Pharaoh does not let them go. He knows that Egypt is finished. Still, the honor. We have that problem. When we have that honor, who is that? Our soul, which means the Israelites inside us, the powers of the soul who wants freedom? Or is it Pharaoh and Egypt who wants to control the soul? We have to learn that one of our biggest mission in life is when every thought comes to our mind, any feeling comes to our heart, we should know if it belongs to us or it's the enemy. What's the enemy? Pharaoh and Egypt, the dark side. Selfishness, whatever is blocking our spiritual growth, whatever is inhibiting all the gifts that God wants to give us, but we can't get it because the law of affinity keeps us away from the source by sticking to fears, hatred, grudge, lust, and all kinds of other addictions. Remember that. So, the locust comes, and, and then there's a plague of darkness. Why? It looks like Moses and God are like, in a haste, let's, let's finish with that already. Why? We know that before the 10th plague, there's no one to talk to. It's just a show. Till the dark side is finished with all 10 forces, you still have him around. You just leave a little bit of it. It's, it's still there. Okay, so now we come to, to chapter 12. Verse 1. And that Pharaoh is still adamant not to send the Israelites away. Chapter 12, verse 1. Vayomer Adonai el Moshe velaron beret Mitzrayim lemo. And God speaks to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. Hachodesh azeh lachem rosh chodashim rishonu lachem lechodesh hashana. This month is the head of the month's for you, it's the first month of the month of the year, which means we are talking about the new moon of Aries, Nisan. So how do you bless the new moon? How do you control the new moon? You need to know the moment of the new moon. You need to have the special meditations and ceremonies that are being done in Jewish tradition since then and on. There's a blessing of the new moon on Shabbat before the, uh, the new moon. They, there are the special prayers and meditations on the day of the new moon. Everything is set and everything is being taught by God to Moses here, chapter 12, verse 1. And you can ask, right now you're talking about blessing of the new moon? You have to get out of Egypt. No, you want to control, you want to fight your enemy, 
you have to be connected to the grid. And here's the grid. It's the celestial grid, which basically speaks about how do we connect, how do we tap into spiritual energy. And here in the same sitting that Moses is getting the secret of the Hebrew calendar till today. And then he says, after the new moon, that is the first day of the new month, and the cycle of 12 months, which is uh, starting in the spring, the month of the spring, Dabu el Kola Dat Israel speak to the whole congregation of Israel, verse 3. It says, when it comes to the 10th day of the month, this month, Nisan, Aries, every household should take a lamb. Aries means a lamb. Each household should take a lamb. And then it speaks about, then you keep that lamb from the 10th of Nisan to the 14th in the twilight, in the sunset. And then you all slaughter the, 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 um, the lamb. And you take the lamb, the blood of the lamb, and you put it on the doorpost and on the lintel. And you roast the lamb on open fire. Do not cut the lamb, just roast it as it is over an open fire. Do not cook it. And eat it with matzah. Matzot al merurim yochlu. Matzot and bitter herbs. Just a second. We are talking about if this is done, this is explained before the new moon, why did the Israelite eat matzot on Passover? So we learn because the dough did not have time to rise. Now we understand that the dough did not have time to rise because they were ordered to over the two weeks earlier when it's a full moon of Aries, you, you slaughter the lamb, you roast it on open fire, and you eat it with matzah, which is a bread made from dough that did not have time to rise, which means from the moment they, uh, the flour got water till the, the matzah is complete, till that bread is flat bread is complete, no more than 18 minutes so it doesn't have time to rise. So why the dough did not have time to rise? Because we were ordered so that it won't have time to rise. So what's the big thing over here? Why do we have to eat the matzah? And as Zohar explains, Uh, verse 80 in the Zohar. When we say they, were, they put blood on the doorpost and the lintel, there were two, two kinds of blood. One was the blood of the lamb, they slaughtered and roasted, and the two, most of them, except from the uh, tribe of Lev Levi, did not circumcise because they were slaves, and the Egyptians did not let them circumcise their children. They circumcised themselves on that evening. All the men who were not circumcised. They took the blood of the circumcision, mixed it with the blood of the lamb, and put it on the doorposts and over the lintel. Something really weird. It's like, sounds like kind of a witchcraft. The real thing is, that when, if you look, the Zohar says, verse 82, If you look at the door, and now you imagine the mark on the lintel above with blood, and then on the right also with blood, the whole thing, but on the left you put also blood, but you don't connect it to the top, to the lintel. You got a Hebrew letter, 
Hey, the letter Hey, and which is also called the holy name. Many times in Jewish tradition, when you want to mark God, you just mark Hey. But you know, Hebrew letters are also numbers. Hey is five. So it turned into the hand five, and the symbol was the hand five and the letter He written on the hand. And that's how Hamsa, Hamsa in Arabic means five. Okay, that's where it came from. The protection is the letter He, not the five fingers. Okay, so that is the protection, which means the moment you mark on yourself that you belong to the God of light, you are being marked as God's territory. Okay? You can find it also in the blessings of the Kohanim. The blessing of the Kohanim is also part of the Hamsa because another way to express protection is the blessing of the priest, the blessing of the Kohanim. In the blessing of the Kohanim, there are also three parts. The Zohar says, when you look at the hay, you have right left and center column three lines right left and center which means to the right chesed loving kindness to the left judgment gvua, to the center tiferet which means central column and when you connect to that you are enlightened i'll explain soon why because when it's when a human being is enslaved is because he is enslaved to the left column. What does it mean left column? Me, myself, and I. Selfishness. It's all about me and I want to get and I don't care about the consequences. How do you heal that? You need compassion, sharing, loving, kindness, grace. That is the right column. And you need also to learn how to synthesize the two of them so you you work with both of them together that gets you into the grid that gets you into the affinity by the law of affinity that you become one with god's light which means when it's not just pure altruism when it is i need to receive because that's my destiny god created me for that purpose to receive god's light but in order to share. So you have a circuitry, right, left, and center, plus, minus, and the filament. Desire to receive, desire to share, and when they're bonded together and merged, synthesized, then you are in the zone. What happens now when you're on the grid? The light comes in. What happens to us when we are enlightened? It's much easier for us to love everybody, to fulfill the message of loving others as thyself. When we are, the only way to remove negativity from within is to bring in the light. How do you drive away darkness? You don't fight it. You don't throw stones at it. You have to bring in the light. How do you fight our own, our own individual private darkness? You don't fight it. You don't go to all kinds of psychologists and you just talk about how terrible you feel and how much you're being abused. You have to be busy connecting to enlightenment. And only the light of God can remove the darkness. So if it is one aspect of the Hamsa is right, left, and center, receiving, sharing, and the ability to connect between them. That light that came in, that night, the moment you balance and so much light is coming in, and so much light did come in, basically what the Zohar is saying, the light that descended to the world, and that night was so powerful, that on one hand it healed the Israelites from what? From being enslaved, for being sick with negativity, for being, you know, when we are not enlightened, 
everything can enslave us. It could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be any kind of other addictions. What people say, what they didn't say. They smile to me, they didn't smile to me. Everything controls my well-being. But when I have this true, individual, direct connection to the light of God, and I'm enlightened, those forces cannot control me anymore. It's a huge secret. Now, the other aspect of the Hamsa is if you look at the hand of a human being, you have 15 parts. Now, the blessing of the Kohanim has three verses. Why three? Right, left, center. It has also 15 words. So, the last word, Shalom, completion, Total balance and harmony appears on that, this kind of hamsa, appears here on the hand. Okay? So, these are the two different hamsas. The one with the name, the, uh, all the words of the blessing of the priest, with the word shalom in here, and the other one is with the letter hey. Both mean the same thing. When are we protected? When we are enlightened. When are we in the zone, when are we delivered to real true freedom? When we learn how to bring God's light inside us, but through the balance of the desire to receive for the sake of sharing. Now, how do we do that? So here, by the way, the Israelites who made sure to connect that way, the result was we can even see that. Nobody ate the lamb by himself. 50 people shared one lamb. So you need to understand there's a message. Don't do it by yourself. Share it with others. The giving, the sharing. The taking care of others. That is our greatest protection. And also at the same time, the need to be strong enough so you can take care for others. But there's another message. What about the matzot? And the Zohar is talking about it. Verse 166 in the Zohar. It says in the Torah, we in the verse that we just read, on the, since that God is telling Moses, not just that you're going to eat matzot on this day, and that's more than two weeks before the event, it's going to be Pesach Ledorotechem. Pesach is going to stay for generations. 33 centuries later, we're still celebrating Pesach exactly the same way. And what does it mean? No chametz. Okay. What's chametz? Chametz is leavened bread. But the leavened bread is a symbol for ego, uh, egotism, pride, honor, how? You take the flower that has no uh, pretension, pretensions and you add water and it sucks it in and it sucks it in and it sucks it in and then you dough and you take, take the dough and you knead the dough and it rises and it rises and it rises like somebody with a deep ego, with a very strong ego. So what do you do? You take that thing that is a symbol of life sustenance and success bread you don't let it rise when you let it rise the it's called leaven bread but in hebrew chametz chametz means sour and by the way the other name the torah gives it is seor sour the word sour in english is coming from that word in english sourdough seor means that you know some bread they rise with yeast some rise with special uh, bacteria that is called a sourdough. That sour makes it rise. It has a deep metaphysical meaning. That is the power of the negativity within. So what do we do? We take the bread, the source of ego, okay, ownership, having it, or the symbolism of satiation, 
feeding, what sustenance, achievement, and you don't let it rise. You make it simtsum over the dough. Then it becomes matzah from chametz. In the word chametz, you have a chet, which means the sin, the letter chet. You break it, it becomes a hay, and then it becomes the word becomes matzah. Matzah, the Zohar says, is the medication against negativity, against egotism. So what the Israelites did created such a revelation of light like never before and ever after in the history of humanity. That light healed the Israelites from their circumcision, circumcision from their negativity. They had reached total enlightenment. The same power killed the firstborns of Egypt. As we know, high voltage is a blessing when you connect to it by code. If you're not connected by code, it will burn you, roast you, fry you to death. That's what happened to Egyptians, which means the symbolism is very powerful. Every year, as we read that, this, the power reappears. And our choice is, do we give up selfishness? Do we give up fighting with the whole world? Matzah, in Hebrew, it means also fighting. It's kind of, it's a double edge, double-sided. Either it's a matzah, healing, or is it fight with the whole world? The message here is very powerful. You want to heal yourself. You want to redeem yourself. You want to achieve elevation and ascension as a spiritual level. You want to achieve greatness. You need to fight the snake within. How do you fight the snake within? It doesn't matter how many times you plague him. The moment the plague is over, he forgets about it. He promises the world to you. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be spiritual. I got my lesson. Never believe him. Why? He just simply wants to be left alone. The moment he's comfortable again, he goes back to the thing he can never change. You never make peace with the darkness. You can never have compromise with the darkness. The only way to fight the darkness is to bring in the light. How do you bring the light? All the, what, all the methods that Torah is teaching us to connect the world above and the world below, to bring in spiritual light, either through meditations, through study of the Torah, to other mitzvot, through awareness and through uh, whatever we do, sharing and charity, whatever, when the moment is coming and we have to stay with that awareness i'm not doing it because it's nice or because it is uh, uh, humane to behave like this i'm doing it because that's the way i bring god's light to into this world and into my own pharaoh it's the only way to get rid of him when we learn how to do that we will achieve true redemption. That's why Passover is such a powerful holiday. It's not about remembering great things God did. It's about bringing in the same power of light, the same projection that allowed the Israelites to get up and leave to feel true freedom. And that means, why can't I go? Why didn't I go earlier? That's when you leave Egypt behind and Pharaoh, and you look behind and say like, where have I been? It's like, what, what helped me over there? We all have our Egypt. We, getting out of Egypt is not a physical thing. It's a spiritual, metaphysical thing of bringing in enlightenment. And that is our own true redemption. That's the only way we can really become greater and the whole story of Passover is being becoming greater, achieving greatness, maturity, and real true freedom. Thank you so much.